Hi, I'm Keith Williams. I'm an American Studies Anthropology major at the University of California at Davis. Today, I want to talk to you about cyborgs. The concept of man trying to rise above his earthly state has been around for centuries, whether it's through the apparatus of religion, who seeks to establish the soul as a vehicle to an ultimate state, or the discipline of philosophy, who has reasoned multiple causes and effects to account for the existence of mankind. Humans have tried to escape their bodies en masse to avoid coming to grips with their finite mortality. In Donna Haraway's A Cyber Manifesto, Science, Technology, and Socialist Feminism in the Late 20th Century, and Chapters 1 and 2 of N. Catherine Hales's How We Became Post-Human, Virtual Bodies in Cybernetics, Literature, and Informatics, the method of removal and recalibration in the digital era is the means where existence is malleable and the end can be delayed. Despite its title, Donna Haraway's call for cyberdom is more of a pleading justification for the marginalized other to embrace, define, and thrive in the new normal of the digital sphere. She begins her piece by defining a cyborg as a cybernetic organism, a hybrid of machine and organism, a creature of social reality, as well as a creature of fiction. Dr. Haraway takes that base definition and constructs a desired reality of what that can mean for marginalized communities, specifically women, when she wrote, I am making an argument for the cyborg as a fiction, mapping our social and bodily reality, and as an imaginative resource, suggesting some very fruitful couplings. Dr. Haraway's thesis makes her point clear when she writes, this chapter is an argument for pleasure in the confusion of boundaries and for responsibility in their construction. It is also an effort to contribute to the socialist feminist culture and theory in a postmodernist, non-naturalist mode, and in the utopian tradition of imagining a world without gender, which is perhaps a world without genesis, but maybe also a world without end. Dr. Haraway's reasoning isn't about the objectivity of the digital but a subjective desire for radical reformation to combat the failure of civil rights movements and political ideologies to carve out an egalitarian reality. The cyborg to Haraway isn't a progression to a more improved or enlightened position in the chain of survival, but a redo in the tradition of people who believe that God offers them a better life after the fact and corrupted beta software that's full with bugs. Further, Dr. Haraway states that her version of a cyborg is a much better idealized version of the flesh and blood human when she claims, the cyborg is resolutely committed to partiality, irony, intimacy, and perversity. It is oppositional, utopian, and completely without innocence. No longer structured by the polarity of public and private, the cyborg defines a technological polis based partly on a revolution of social relations in the oikos, the household. Nature and culture are reworked. The one can no longer be the resource for appropriation or incorporation by the other. Next, Dr. Haraway pinpoints three crucial boundary breakdowns that she believes makes it possible for cyborgs to exist. One, the distinctions of humans and animals have been lessened. Two, Machines have been built to match man in autonomous capacity. And three, the miniaturization of technology has made it easier for machines to be made mobile and meshed with humans themselves. So those three clues leave Dr. Haraway to follow. So my cyborg myth is about transgressed boundaries, potent fusions, and dangerous possibilities, which progressive people might explore as one part of needed political work. One of my premises is that most American socialists and feminists see deepened dualisms of mind and body, animal and machine, idealism and materialism in the social practices, symbolic formulations, and physical artifacts associated with high technology and scientific culture. But what about the current state of the marginalized? Does Dr. Haraway give up hope? Yes, and she spends a huge chunk of time arguing against the feminist status quo and in favor of moving to what seems to be a new wave of feminism. In this regard, she cites Chela Sandoval and her model of oppositional consciousness, which is akin to Bell Hooks' concept of the oppositional gaze. 
Hooks writes, the gays has been and is a site of resistance for colonized black people globally. Subordinates in relations to power learn experientially that there is a critical gaze, one that looks to document, one that is oppositional. In resistance struggle, the power of the dominated to assert agency by claiming and cultivating awareness politicizes looking relations. One learns to look a certain way in order to resist. And Haraway sees this struggle and defiance from women of color as a way to fortify the armor of her cyborg. Dr. Haraway believes that in this modern day, when the marginalized other attempts to exceptionalize themselves, they simply highlight the power of the dominant class. Even in moments of liberation, like suffrage and the fight for fair pay, are grounded in traditional definitions of gender. In that regard, Haraway states that the rewriting of the rules and history of gender are useless. In Haraway's cyborg utopia, everything is malleable and dynamic. Statistics and data will ultimately determine human decisions. Emotions and feelings will be cross-checked with this data. Although citizenship is autonomous, it is part of the composite state. We are all one and everyone simultaneously. The cyborg is fluid and embedded into universal commonality. The current fights of oppositions will be null and void. Further, Dr. Haraway believes that the tools, means, and processes to accomplish this redo to make this cyborg is already here through militarization of machines and the democratization of tools allow many people to remake their personas. Although Dr. Haraway further speaks about the current state of the digital world where neoliberalism through the homework economy has further marginalized the other and against the current state of feminism and its drive towards a feminist luditism, it is her open embrace of the feminist cyborg that has people like N. Catherine Hales concerned. In N. Catherine Hales' piece, she identifies four key conditions of post-human. First, the body is the host of the brain. There, the person is a sum of unequal parts. Second, the mind inside the body is the first draft of consciousness. It's the beginning of an iterative process for improvement. Third, the body serves the mind through the mind's need to extend and prolong itself. The body is the mind's Lego set. And fourth, the body and machine are seamlessly interchangeable. As the text says, there are no essential differences and absolute demarcations between bodily existence and computer simulation, cybernetic mechanism, and biological organism, robot theology, and human goals. Further, Hell sorts out the differences between current liberal humanism and post-human in regards to individuality. Humanism, she states, is where the human being owns themselves. Their body is their own and the opening bid for them to sell their labor. Their collective components are natural constructions that they can sell on the open market. Post-human, on the other hand, is simply a base model like a car. It's subject to dynamic construction through the collective contribution of others. This being subject to continuous construction and reconstruction to fit into whatever role necessary for them to fill. As Hales succinctly put, If human essence is freedom from the wills of others, the post-human is post, not because it is necessary unfree, but because there is no a priori way to identify a self-will that can be clearly distinguished from an other will. It is important to recognize that the construction of the post-human does not require the subject to be a literal cyborg. Whether or not interventions have been made on the body, new models of subjectivity emerging from such fields as cognitive science and artificial life imply that even a biological unaltered homo sapiens counts as post-human. Post-humanism here is a radical iteration that mind controls the body. It's an attempt to reject the importance of the body as part of the whole person. It is with this setup that Hales claims her thesis. I see the deconstruction of the liberal humanist subject as an opportunity to put back into the picture the flesh that continues to be erased in contemporary discussions about cybernetic subjects. Hence, my focus on how information lost its body for this story is central to creating what author Croker has called the flesh-eating 90s. 
A little later, she says, My dream is a version of the post-human that embraces the possibilities of information technologies without being seduced by fantasies of unlimited power and disembodied immortality, that recognizes and celebrates finitude as a condition of human being, and that understands human life is embedded in a material world of great complexity, one on which we depend for our continued survival. Hales believes in the idea of the viability of the whole person, that the mind's separate crowd is simply staging the same tired fight for extension and everlasting life of the self. Hales traces three distinctive waves in which liberal humanism has been chipped down to a cybernetic belief in cyborgs. The first of these waves began in 1943 through the Macy conferences in cybernetics. The first wave was intended to show that humans and machines could be both seen as information processing entities. The emphasis was on homeostasis, which is thought to be man's innate capacity to maintain equilibrium through diversified conditions. However, like most theories, the fine print is messy, and the messiness came in the form of reflexivity, or commonly known as creating an ideal based on assumptions. Or, as Helves explains, the dreamer creates the student, but the dreamer in turn is dreamt by another, who was in turn dreamt by someone else, and so on to infinity. The second wave tried to incorporate perceptions of the observer. Instead of basing the functioning of a system based on how we think it should work, we should respect the system state. So the second wave was organized, as Hells wrote, organisms respond to their environment in ways determined by their internal self-organization. Their one and only goal is continually to produce and reproduce the organization that defines them as systems. Hence, they are not only self-organizing, but also autopoetic, or self-making. The third way flexes this independence further to state that not only do systems survive and thrive on their own, but evolve away from its perceiver. The system is on its own sustaining system on its own path. If these views are indeed correct, then many systems, like humans, are basically non-bodied information processing centers. Hales rejects this cybernetic view because of the host of theories that contested them, even within their own discussions. Plus, in the spirit of how life runs, you can't dismiss the influence of time, context, and location. Information is local, and to universalize it, puts you in an outlying space. In Chapter 2 of her book, Hells defines how the gap between signifiers, meaning signs, and the signifying, meaning their meaning, gets widened as digital technology proliferates in everyday life. Hells compares old world forms of communication like handwritten letters to new forms of digital communications like email. The production and process of a handwritten letter, one directly handwrites a series of letters on a piece of paper to produce meaning. It's the case of direct one-on-one -on -one contact between signifier and the signified. There's no intermediary. However, in the case of email, there are a lot of layers in the production and process. For one, the translation from hitting a letter on a keyboard or signifier goes through a lot of complex steps in order to be signified on one's computer screen. In addition, there are many ways to represent email, like JPEGs and PDF forms. Her thesis for this chapter seems to be saying just that. I am now in a position to state the thesis of this chapter explicitly. The contemporary pressure towards dematerialization, understood as an epistemic shift towards pattern randomness and away from presence absence, affects human and textual bodies on two levels at once, as a change in the body, the mysterious substrate, and as a change in the message, the codes of representation. Stated this way, the more we move away from the direct reality to the proxy of the virtual, the definitions of being human has the capacity to create new meanings and realities. In the instance of her flickering signifier, when signifiers are indirectly translated, meanings have an opportunity to be random and fluid. Later, Dr. Hells uses the cyberpunk genre, specifically the works of William Gibson, to extend the evolution of the signifier and the signified through the concept of cyberspace and, as Hell states, to desperate spaces of computer simulations, networks, and hypertext windows. 
Overall, Doctors Haraway and Hales looked critically at the age of the cyborg. However, Haraway was to jump in with little hesitation as possible, while Hales says, not so fast.